All right. So thank you all. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Jorge Figueroa Flores, and welcome to our uh, panel series on the future of education and ChatGPT's role in it. Uh, today, we go into our second part, our second group of guests with us today that we're gonna be discussing the promise and challenges of AI in education. Uh, with me today, I'm so happy to have uh, Dr. Sara Rodriguez, Associate Professor from Engineering Education at Virginia Tech. Uh, Mr. Mark, Mark Watkins, Lecturer in Composition and Rhetoric at the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Robert Cummings, Executive Director of Academic Innovation at the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss as well. All right. Thank you all. And as you all know, this is uh, a collaboration uh, between my good friend, Dr. Linda Murphy, Mur Murphy's office, Teaching and Learning with Technology, and my office, Curriculum and Strategic Initiatives, to bring conversations that are mostly needed in academia and outside also the parameters of academia in regards to what is going on with AI in education. You all know, recent in recent days, I would say, a big explosion happened, okay, in academia and also outside academia in regards to the use of this AI language model of ChatGPT. So it has created panic, it has created emotion, it has created so many things as well. And today in our part two, we're just going to, you know, talk a little bit, um, uh, talk a little bit about, about, you know, how this has evolution, how can, what aspects can we work with, you know, and, and basically put our way of thinking in, 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 in things. So, so looking forward to, to a big conversation and just to start, uh, just to start uh, the conversation for today, what comes to your mind to our panelists here? What comes to your mind when you, when we think about the promise and challenges of AI in education? Anyone can start. I'm going to let Bob start because he's, he's in a hotel room. They might be kicking him out in a minute now. So I'm going to let him start. <laughs> and, and go well, thank you, everybody. It's good to be with you. I invite everybody to jump in uh, when they have the chance. I know that we've been talking to our faculty, faculty on our campus and faculty on different campuses about some of the challenges. And there sort of seem to be waves of concerns. One of the first waves of concerns has to do with uh, essentially authentication in environments where we're trying to verify student learning. And we're worried that what we may see is uh, outputs of AI that may stand in the way of understanding what an individual knows. And so when we approach that challenge, I like to invite us to think about, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically about AI writing generators at this moment, but when we think about AI writing generators and the types of assignments we're assigning and what we might want to change, I ask us to think about the use of writing to report learning and the use of writing to explore or create learning. So in environments where we're asking for the use of writing to report learning, that could be a term paper, that could be an exam, um, some of the development of these new AI powered writing generator tools are seriously an issue, right? That we don't want to see AI output instead of human output or students output. Um, but beyond that, um, what we're looking at at the University of Mississippi and have been doing for a while, Mark can speak with, with greater detail about this, but we have been employing the use of AI writing assistance in our classrooms. And our general strategy for that is to narrow our writing tasks into specific stages in larger projects and articulate what the specific goal of that writing stage is. So it might be invention, exploring an idea, finding resources to support or thwart an, an idea, uh, revising. So we look at each specific writing process and then we invite instructors to think about ways to pair that writing goal with a specific AI writing generator tool. For instance, a tool that is used often is Elicit. Elicit is an AI tool that can take a piece of text and go and find sources that probably, after you know, it takes some review of the output, but they probably are sources that 
are related to the ideas that a writer is advancing. And so after we pair that specific writing task with a specific AI tool, we invite students to reflect on the process and we invite them to think about um, how this is different from the writing process they may have experienced already in high school or in other college classes. And we do this in part for two reasons. This is sort of the third concept I think we talk a lot about here. Um, we don't have the option of walking away from these tools. We know these tools exist. Our students know these tools exist. And we know they're going to be using them in the workplace or some version of them that iterates in the future. So our job is to help our students prepare for that workplace or prepare for that graduate school experience that engages AI in some way. And so we think it's really vital to go ahead and try to, to engage the AI tools, specifically the writing generators at this stage. Obviously, lots of challenges there because as Mark can talk about, probably the, the problem of the tools iterating and the environment in which these tools are developed is a sort of a competitive free-for-all gold rush that uh, ensures maximum chaos. So um, there's a lot of opportunity in there, but there's also a lot of worry and a lot of disruption in there. I absolutely agree. It's like trying to call your pet in from outside during a hurricane. It's not really gonna happen anytime soon. It's, it's just too much chaos. And we get, we really need some stability for the tools to sort of like settle down and actually have some time to explore how this is going to impact our students, both writing and also research and thinking too. And we are primarily focusing on writing, but generative AI is a huge umbrella. It includes coding, um, it includes Art. music, voice, text, all of it, all of it throughout there too. So I think it is a, a really important thing to think about too. Um, we have been working with students now for two semesters with it. Um, back with, before ChatGPT launched in November, uh, we had begun to do a pilot using some of these tools um, with students, and we got about 70,000 words of reflection now. And so we're combing through that to see really what's changing about their writing process. And I think it will calm down faculty a great deal to realize that students are not necessarily um, moving to adopt these tools at the speed at which Microsoft, Google, and Meta are releasing them. Um, many of our students are very cautious to um, give up their sort of organic thinking and writing process to an algorithm. Um, we are noticing that now from this, you know, sort of second version of our pilot we're running now this semester is that students will sort of tepidly start using some of the tools or the techniques, but they're not just all rushing in to um, begin generating everything. Uh, so I think that's a great relief um, having done this now for two semesters of students to realize is that uh, it's not necessarily going to be this gigantic um, tidal wave that matches the uh, deployment of the tools. Sarah? Yeah, some things that I think about when I think about challenges and promises, it, it makes me think about the fact that it's not about the tool, you know, at this point. It's about how we come to it. It's about, you know, the philosophy that we're having around what it means to know things, even at a very, very basic level. Um, and I think for a lot of, at least the faculty that, I, that I'm that i seeing, you know, you're really having to dig a little bit deeper of, well, what are you really having, what are you really trying to do with the assignments? What are you really trying to do with demonstrating knowledge? Like, are you trying to get students to regurgitate knowledge? Or are you trying to get them to get at a higher level? You know, and I think, honestly, like it's, we're going to take a lot more work. Like we're going to have to rethink as educators, really the way that we even think about knowledge production. Um, one other thing that I had in my mind just while, you know, while y'all were talking was what level of learning are we talking about too? Like, are we talking about college students? Um, like, are we talking about undergrads? Are we talking about community college students? Are we talking about graduate students? I, I think the approach that we're going to need to take is very different um, considering what level students might be at. Um, and also just the trauma that some students are coming to campus with in terms of writing um, in particular. Um, you know, you may have students that have had really negative experiences and this could be a really wonderful tool to get students excited about writing and seeing that writing is an iterative process. I came from an English background back before I was in engineering. And 
or in engineering ed. And, you know, I feel like a lot of students come to writing often with so much trauma around their classroom experience, their writing experiences. And this could be a really fascinating tool for addressing, you know, educational trauma, I think, in the classroom. So, so one of the things when, when we're seeing uh, um, all these tools that are emerging as well, and, and, and they're coming in and out, not only chat GPT, but other tools as well, you know, it's like, AI powered chatbots, virtual assistants, you know, they offer immediate feedback and support and can offer support to students, specifically enhancing their engagement and motivation as well. So how can we promote uh, in a positive way all these tools when we're getting so many of them at the same time in order to engage the students and motivate them uh, to continue their learning process? If I could jump in to try to answer that, I think we're going to see, I'm hopeful we're going to see a shakeout of tools. Uh, and as the educational uh, technology developers start to integrate these tools into their packages, one of the potentials that you may remember the, and I certainly remember having been actively part of the adaptive learning coursewares movement that was, you know, very big in the last few years. Uh, the joke about adaptive learning was that we would have ro robot tutors in the sky. So that was always sort of this derisional phrase that was brought up to talk about how uh, the promise of using technology to provide customized or personalized instruction was just not there. Um, that there, for the most part, uh, the promise of taking the content that might be in a content-oriented class and then having uh, using technology to make it personalized for the learner was not ready. I'm optimistic at this early stage that some of the new tools will provide that opportunity. And I think it's possible to envision a future where tools that are like a chat GPT feature would be customized to be experts in engaging the challenges and types of problems that different learners would have with different content and different subjects and provide tutoring supports that are more customized and personalized and meaningful. Now, that's a long way off. Uh, right now, it's still the Wild West. And so for today, I think the strategy that Mark and his colleagues that we're using in writing and rhetoric is the one that makes the most sense, which is to say, narrow the scope of what you're trying to do in a specific part of your classroom teaching and learning process, and then try to match that with tools, encourage exploration, encourage a healthy dose of doubt uh, and review, and then also encourage reflection and explore these tools along with your students after setting up some guardrails around what that engagement should look like. Anyone that wants to jump in? I think for me, like I, so I mostly teach graduate students. And for me, for me to really feel okay with doing anything in terms of graduate students, because grad students, they are about production and, and new knowledge and things. And, you know, until I know what the ramifications are in terms of plagiarism, in terms of, you know, intellectual property, I feel very uncomfortable, <laughs> you know, with, with how graduate students are going to be using this, um, like in terms of actual writing, in terms of the process of writing, I think that it can be awesome and it can be wonderful. Um, but I do have some reservation about when you get like to the dissertation process um, and how we can be helpful in the dissertation process without saying, oh, just don't use chat GPT. Like, you know, like how could we actually like get around the dissertation process in a meaningful way that could integrate this kind of tool? Um, because I, I get it for the undergrads. I get it for, you know, process. I get it for, you know, getting your writing up uh, to a better level. I, I think for creating actual published material, that's where I start to get a little bit nervous um, of where it can go. Um, because to be honest, like I've been trying, I've been trying it out. I've been seeing like if I could write my book with ChatGPT, 
which the answer is no, and it's really awful. <laughs> um, but I wanted to see like how far could you get on a chapter um, by doing that, and you can get pretty darn far, you know, in trying to do that. And so I feel like you know, unless we're going to have some sort of parameters, I think particularly graduate students are really vulnerable in this whole conversation. Mark, I think that's a really good point. Um, I teach mostly first year writing students. And um, one of the parameters I've set with them and that um, we initially played around with and, and now basically set on is that I want them to always start with human-based writing. I want them to preserve their writing process and only call on AI assistance when they need it. Now, sometimes they don't know when they need it because they're still exploring and still merging with their own writing process, but it's usually when they hit a pain point in the writing. So yesterday we had a workshop um, we had some wonderful students come in. They're writing a synthesis essay. It's a very long essay for most of them. It's really the first essay where they can't get out of um, uh, not using the five paragraph essay. They have to go beyond the five paragraph essay. We've been trying to talk with them for over a semester about how uh, strategies and ability to do this. Now you have to do this. And so many of them come up here and they just uh, present blocks of text that are page or page and a half long. So they don't know how to organize ideas and make it more concise. Well, I was working with one of my students, as you usually do, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and it usually takes me about 20, 25 minutes to kind of work through one paragraph with them, give them some strategies, some, some ideas. Um, so if I had told that student, well, just take it to chat GPT, write a prompt, and say, make this more concise, and therefore your essay will be fixed. Where's the learning curve? Where's that actually happen? But I, what I did last yesterday was I used one paragraph with one student and said, look, we're going to design a prompt with a heuristic to help you look at this for one paragraph, just one paragraph, okay? And it broke down that paragraph and gave her different rewrite options and talked about why they're rewriting and talked about different strategies they could be used for too in a matter of seconds. And then that becomes a strategy to look at the rest of the paper using her own organic process. So that to me is the sort of parameter we need to be seeking out. And that's really what we're, what we're kind of describing here now is almost as an emergent practice about how to use AI with yep. students, what sort of boundaries you want to do too. Because this student, she known about AI for the entire semester, but she was not really that interested in using it, but then she saw what that could do. And the aha moment was, gee, I'm not going to shove my whole essay in here. It's just, oh, wow, I could actually learn something from this very quickly. And it's a helpful strategy to go through it. So it really is going to be about time more than anything else, time to explore these tools, time to actually vet them and sort of understand them. I mean, the tools we used in the fall, <laughs> they're not the same anymore. They're not. They've been updated. The technology has gone through. Um, we mentioned a few of the uh, different uh, tools that are running it now. Wolfram Alpha is now running it. They just agreed to do that with a plug-in. Uh, Quizlet is now running ChatGPT. And of all things, Snapchat now has ChatGPT <laughs> in it. As my students said to me before they went on spring break a week ago, I was like, why on earth is this in Snapchat? I was like, guys, I don't know. But they got talking about this. And really what's going on is that there's so much fear of missing out in the big tech company too, that everyone's gobbling these things up without use cases. Um, it's really kind of becoming the point where we are, as Bob said, kind of reaching a saturation point where there's like so much of this technology out here without much reason why. Uh, so we really have to sit down and search for that. But that takes time. That takes resources. And that takes the ability to breathe uh, against this sort of onslaught. Well, I think that specifically with this technology, it's going to happen the same thing as you know, that happened with Web 2.0. Remember when Web 2.0 started? It bombarded us with all these opportunities. <laughs> I remember that. The blogs, the wikis, and the podcasts. Remember that? Like uh, some of you might be too young. I'm like, I don't know. Specifically <laughs> when, when that happened. But I, I remember specifically the, um, talking with a couple of my friends when MySpace show up and suddenly you had a generator that you were able to produce all things for your classroom classes, you know, and we weren't thinking, you know, about things. So the transition is, is, is incredible and the evolution of these technologies uh, are crazy, but just as immersive technologies that they are, uh, I think they work as a great scaffold because one thing is for sure, we should never focus on the technology first. We should always focus on the pedagogy first. And, and, and they historically, they have served as a scaffold. It's how we're using it and how we're working with them and how they adapt. But it's really interesting to see that specifically for Gen, 
Gen Z students or maybe alpha students as well. Uh, you know, you're talking about Snapchat. So it's being involved already, Chat GPT, into this um, a platform, this, this social media platform. So what is behind it, you know, really in regards to how social media will be evolution as well with the use of these AI language modes. It's really interesting. So, you know, that, that caught my attention because also it's, it's involving other areas in which our students graduate, undergraduate students as well are in, getting into it. So I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we will see a, a, a meta version at some point of, of Shark GPT where we add our VR glasses and suddenly we do this and we do that in, in just a, in a projected scenario. So I, I, I don't know where we're going to go with this. It's just like, I just don't panic at all. I just see it and I just move with it and, and see how it can be adaptive, if so, but also very careful with the part that has to do with plagiarism because that has definitely put, I will say, giving us like the hard time and question mark on all this. So they're part of plagiarism. So how are you all as, as faculty dealing with the, the evolution of these technologies in education, but specifically the effect that is causing on the plagiarism issue per se? Sarah, would you like to, to start with? Well, and this kind of goes with Kelly's question um, that's in the in the chat. You know, this is something that I think about a lot just in terms of grad students. Um, but I mean, we're already seeing like I was at South by Southwest, which is an awesome conference, and a ton of talk was done about chat GPT because South by is kind of, you know, the cutting edge and tech and ed tech. Um, and the whole thing that I saw in terms of like people at the exhibitors, like was people that have this detection, you know, the the plagiarism detection. Oh, we're gonna combat chat GPT. So I feel like on one hand, we've got a ton of people who are about to make a ton of money, like trying to solve the plagiarism problem um, associated with chat GPT. How do you detect chat GPT? And I kind of get very annoyed <laughs> with that sort of ed tech. Um, just because I see it as a lot of institutions like are going to adopt this because they don't have the time and the resources and the efforts like our one institution. Sure, like we can have this really cute philosophical conversation about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and wonderful and we have resources and people at teaching and learning centers to help us. That's great. And it's going to work out. But I think about institutions that don't have those resources, like regional comprehensive institutions, like institutions that I've been at, like they don't have the time to sit here and think about all these things. So they're going to end up getting these detection softwares. That's how they're going to solve the problem potentially. And I, I think there's, they can be taken advantage of. Um, I think there, there's space to be taken advantage of there. Um, but in terms of plagiarism, you know, right now, I am still running everything through Turnitin. Like that's not really gonna catch. I, that's not like, this is actually just what I'm doing. And I haven't, I haven't engaged with this in my own classes beyond, you know, the process based, you know, type things. And so I think in terms of plagiarism, what I would like to fold into what I do is folding it in more in terms of the scaffolding um, and so turning it into the process that we've been talking about, but also thinking about, you know, in terms of plagiarism, how you can make something that goes across the entire semester. So I've always done my classes where everything goes across the semester. And I think that what you can do by, you know, scaffolding your whole class like that is you have students going back and forth so often with their own writing and or chat GPT, fine. Like, but by the time that you have an end product, it is a product that for the most part probably is theirs because even if it was started with chat GPT, chat GPT is not gonna be able to sustain them through the entire process um, of going back and forth. Mark, what are you doing? <laughs> with with the part that has to do with uh, with uh, plagiarism and intellectual property, specifically, you mentioned that uh, that you work with uh, with students in the first year, uh, undergraduate students. So, 
how how is this going into your courses? How are you working with them? Well, the question of um, cheating and academic dishonesty using it, I think, is um, very interesting. It's something we're going to have to basically uh, come to terms with. I don't think it's necessarily plagiarism because plagiarism has a very specific definition. And however you look at how um, language models function, they generally generate material too. Sometimes they can copy something from the training data, but usually they break the chain of citation. So it's very unclear where it's coming from. They also have the capacity to generalize. So they're not just completely repeating what they're trained on. Um, so it becomes a much more philosophical question of how you do you treat this. You treat this as like found text. You treat it like clip art. How do you actually begin to cite it and actually be able to integrate it too? Um, what Bob kind of said at the very beginning here too is talking about that there's uh, writing to learn and writing to demonstrate knowledge too are two very separate categories of where you want to have a very clear boundary with using this technology. Um, I will say this, if you ask your students specifically to reflect on their learning process with their own ideas, their own words, that's not something they generally are going to go to an algorithm to do. As one student said in class, Mr. Watkins, that sounds so cringe. Why would I do that with an algorithm? <laughs> I, I could just tell you how I learned today, right? So if students are using the technology to, as we say, cheat, that problem probably isn't to do with the technology. It's probably much further upstream than us in, in web, upstream of your actual classroom, upstream of everything else, something that's going on with the student that's going to deal with that situation. The vast majority of our students don't want to cheat. Um, that said, there are cases that we've been brought to me in the department too. I've had about a dozen of them come up, uh, not from my teaching, but from other teachers too, to actually look at this, where they suspect AI. And after looking at it and going through the sources too, to see things that are made up, it's definitely clear in a few of those cases that AI was definitely present. But in a lot of those cases, at least uh, I would say a third, if not more, there's nothing there. It's just the projection of what the teacher's seen in the actual thing too. And it almost becomes like a counseling session talking to them. It's like, look, there are typos in this. The AI does not generate typos. There are actual real sources that are outside of its training data that just happened last week. AI really can't do that yet. So it really is becoming a situation where um, we're seeing people kind of panic and freak out. And I'm not a huge fan of these AI detectors. I think that they are a... Um, horrible time bomb, to, so to speak, too, because we don't necessarily have clear data rights to upload our student writing to third-party detectors, in some cases that have just been invented by no-name companies overnight, without knowing if this is going to be FERPA compliant, without having any understanding what happens to that student data when it's uploaded there, too. Uh, we do know how language models are trained is through large amounts of actual data, we may be feeding the actual beast to train future language models if we keep this up. Yeah. Uh, and that's something to really keep in mind. And everything that I've seen too, from my own private testing of all these different detection devices from GPT-0 to even OpenAI's um, AI text classifier, uh, it, it is not in any way, shape or form the same thing as the plagiarism checker. Uh, I uploaded <laughs> part of the constitution to it. And chat GPT-0 says that this was Definitely AI generated and AI text classifier says, nope, it's human generated. So they don't even have agreement on the constitution. Oh, well, that's really interesting. You're dealing with the constitution. So really, really <laughs> open-minded there. So uh, what do you think, Bob? Tell me, tell me a little bit about this. Well, I, I really second what I've, what I've heard in the conversation so far. Tools are evolving, uh, they, they, are presenting a range of possibilities. Um, those possibilities present challenges in the classroom. I would group those challenges, more serious of those challenges come in the area of academic integrity. So what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do in your classroom? Are you trying to do, are you, if you're trying to measure learning, then I would think through about ways to verify authentication. But if you're trying to create learning, you're in a situation where these tools will be part of the workplace or a different version of these tools is going to be part of the workplace. So any knowledge that we can give our students with engaging these tools for purposes of expressing or exploring knowledge, that's going to be valuable to them. And I think I believe in reflection as a learning tool. And I, I think this really calls for reflection to allow our students the opportunity 
to put the experience of engaging AI for specific classroom purposes into context. And it's like what Mark was saying earlier, and there was a colleague that did GPT-2 at uh, North Carolina State in a business class, and it's been written in the Chronicle. And, you know, his, he said, we're going to use GPT-2 to, quote, cheat, end quote, in our class. And we're going to use it to write our term papers. And almost uniformly, the student response was, after trying that for a while, they said, please, please, just let me write my own term paper. Because they didn't want to wrestle with that tool and to, to try to use it as a way to express what they had learned. So there's, there's a wide range there, but I, I think that uh, the general strategy of examining specific AI writing generators for specific purposes in learning is going to be valuable in, when incorporated with reflection. Um, and sort of back to what the other uh, folks have said already, it's an opportunity to examine the purposes of what we're doing in the classroom. What is our assignment trying to do? What student learning outcome is being engaged? How does this help our students match the outcome? And then we can evaluate all the tools. I mean, the LMS itself could be evaluated as a tool in terms of helping students reach the student learning outcome. So it's a, it's a big it's a big step forward. There's a lot of reasons to uh, um, I don't know, be concerned. There are lots of headlines that we're going to read and continue to read that will make us be concerned. But um, as far as classroom purposes go, I, I think that there are just, there are a lot of opportunities. One thing that we haven't, I don't think we've talked about yet, and Mark has talked about this before, but if we step back from the classroom applications, one of the big challenges we have here is in digital literacy itself. And heretofore, if you read, if you were to read writing, you could logically assume that a human was involved in that. Maybe a group of humans, maybe people you know, maybe people you don't know, but all writing was a human product. That is no longer the case. Our brains are not wired to handle that change. The, the human brains that get developed after hours, they will have a better chance at learning that concept and interpreting that concept. But we're right now on the cusp of a profound change in literacy. And those of you that are familiar with Stanley Fish and his work, is there a text in this class? You, I, I need to go and pull that off my bookshelf and reread it. Because what I'm reminded of is the fact that when we're engaging writing generators, there's not human sentience behind those expressions. There's just mathematical probability about which tokens will follow the input tokens. And the meaning is actually conveyed, I would submit, when the human reader reads that text, not when it is generated through an algorithm. So big changes and more changes to come. Oh, one of the things that, um, that I've heard as we were talking here has to do with the importance of reflection. You know, the importance of reflection all the time. Always love to hear uh, critical pedagogy principles involved when I'm talking uh, with folks. So one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the things here is that have been mentioned um, as well has to do with accessibility and affordability. Yes, affordability. Is this, are these technologies for only a few? or for all. And that's very important because we have seen also with the evolution in a couple of months of, let me take as an example, ChatGPT. Now there's an upgrade to plus button in the original ChatGPT. So, so where are we going with this? How can we ensure that these AI, basically power education tools, uh, AI and education tools, you know, and platforms are inclusive and accessible to all students? regardless of their socioeconomic background, uh, abilities, statuses, because like we're seeing here already from an open tool, now you have to pay potentially to get other things. So where are we going with this? You know, it's only for a couple, if this is also going to promote the digital divide that we're seeing as well that exists and that we 
have to always talk about it. And some people like to not talk about it. You know, like, where are we going with this? Your opinions. I mean, I think at a very base level, higher ed in specific needs to figure out, are we going to go with it or are we going to go against it? Like what's, what's going to be our, you know, MO, I guess, on that? Like, are we going to try to detect it, you know, and work against it? Are we going to try to work with it? If we're working with it, then, you know, are we going to integrate it into our LMS? You know, what, what are we actually going to do? Like, I think if we're going to try to work with it, then... I mean, it should be free to all students <laughs> and it should come in their LMS and it should be utilized like it should be a, a bigger conversation. Um, if we decide to go against it, then students need to have access to be able to run their own stuff. And, you know, just like you would with Turnitin, like, I mean, I feel like if it's going to be something that we're going to engage with, we need to fully engage with it um, and not have some middle of the road engagement. Um, you know, where people are going to get access. I mean, wealthy students are going to get access. Like, I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, if we're going to full scale decide to lean into it, then I, we need to full scale do that. No, I, I agree completely. And I think that if this technology is widely adopted and it's cheap enough too, it has a profound impact on equity, not just in the United States, but in, throughout the world, uh, especially if you can actually have access to it. Um, one of the things we've been playing around with isn't just writing and research assistance, there are actually reading assistants too, mm -hmm. where you can upload a PDF and embed AI within the PDF and then use a chat feature to go through this. So um, again, I teach first year writing students, so it's very difficult to find research to teach to first year writing students that is at their level. Uh, it's always terms that they just kind of get um, stuck onto and they just stop reading because of it. But we used um, SciSpace, which is one, and Explain Papers, another, where they can actually just upload a PDF and then go through at any point in time they need extra help. They can highlight a term and then in natural language, the um, reading assistant will be able to explain it to them. And they're multilingual too. So if you're a non-native English speaker and you need help working through this document, even if the document itself is not in English, because you do it that way too, it's all really helpful. Um, and there's also the fact that this works in transcription software too. Like so many of our faculty still rely on lecture in some way, shape or form. Um, you can upload your lecture uh, or your students can upload the lecture to Whisper, which is OpenAI's transcription software. And that isn't necessarily new. We've had AI transcription software for a long time, but once it's uploaded, it's in OpenAI's playground. It's in AI. So you can, with one command, summarize the actual notes. With another command, you can create a study plan. With another command, you can create a synthesis of old past notes. And then with another command, you can actually create a sample test questions based off of that. Wow, that's profound. So what uh, would have been something that maybe only students who had a recognized disability would do before could then be something that could be unlocked by the entire class. But then that's going to get into a greater debate too, which is some professors are going to say, well, wait, I want my students to practice active listening skills. I don't want them to fall asleep during my lectures. I don't want them just to upload this there too. So we're going to see waves upon waves of this and debates um, you know, throughout as the technology really does um, sort of hit, I think for me, from my own sort of philosophy, I always do come back to the idea of equity and how this can actually impact it. Um, but I, I do think it's not going to necessarily be a clear path to that. We're going to have lots and lots of debates and there's going to be companies too that are, they're going to be making lots of money off this stuff, lots of money off this stuff. And we're seeing that happening already by other companies in getting involved and creating their own mechanisms to this. And, and we're seeing, you know, all this happening. Bob, you're, you're. Or I, I wanted to add yeah, something. Sure. So like in terms of what Mark said, like Mark, sometimes I feel like even though you're teaching like the first year, you know, writing course, like sometimes I feel like that because I teach first year doc students and not to say that it's the same level of writing, but in some ways, like it is a lot of the same kinds of things that you have to do in terms of process and, and things like that. And while you were talking, I just think about the the wonderful thing that could happen in terms of literature reviews for students who haven't been exposed. I think about first gen, you know, doctoral students or whatnot. Like I think about people who don't understand kind of the graduate school game, like 
you know, in terms of literature reviews and things like that. And how awesome is it going to be to be able to feed in these things to, you know, an AI system so that you could build a literature review matrix so that you could, you know, build a better literature review faster. Um, anyway, it, it made me think of that for grad students. So. Bob, I don't know if you want to add something to this, to this discussion specifically. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, I, I'll go back to what you started with, which was the value of reflection. So again, this is a <clears throat> reflection. I won't get on to a subtopic, but reflection has so many benefits for our students. But one of them is the ability to um, synthesize a diverse array of experiences. So as we talked about, you know, we, we're really zeroing in on writing generators, but we know there's image generators. We know there are video generators. We know there are, uh, I've heard of, but have not seen music generators. So we know that these technologies are gonna affect a range of different productivities and outputs. Well, Reflection is valuable for our students in all of these contexts to document their processes, to document how they engage with these tools, and it will prepare them. This it's the, I think our best tool for preparing them for a workplace where they they encounter these technologies in in their jobs because they will be able to see they will be more likely to be able to integrate new practices into their workflows if they have documented previously what they did when they last encountered a new AI technology. They'll be more likely to be able to say, oh, wait a minute, I'm using a video generator as part of a work assignment. I remember when I use a writing generator in my college classroom. They'll be more likely to tap into that experience and apply what they learned going forward. So I, I just, again, would go back to the idea that if we can continue it's not a panacea. It doesn't solve all the problems that we're talking about here. Uh, one of the problems that we haven't addressed yet is uh, the fact that essentially all of these tools are built on databases of stolen tech or stolen documents. I mean, the, the, uh, there's, there's almost no way that the underlying databases have been permissioned properly and the lawsuits are following that. So there are lots of uh, intellectual property issues that will be involved in these tools in their future evolution. But I believe, and I think you all do too, this just increases the value of reflection. So if we can incorporate reflection as we promote engagement with evolving technologies, it's really the best way to prepare our students to get the most out of these experiences. And, and I sympathize with what Sarah said and what Mark has said. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging. It's a brave new world. And, you know, as a teacher, before I bring a technology into the classroom, I have to be relatively sure that whatever I'm bringing into the classroom gives my students a reasonable shot at mastering the student learning outcome. Otherwise, it doesn't have a place in my classroom. Well, it's challenging because these technologies are iterating so quickly. So there again, I think that the smart process for evaluating them is to narrow the scope, narrow the scope of the application of the technology, narrow the scope of its function and assignment design, and narrow the scope in terms of what its role will be in overall assessment. Um, and that gives us the best opportunity for a successful engagement for students. It's really interesting what you all are saying, specifically um, how, how we're putting together um, this situation and maximizing uh, the, the impact that is having with our students and the impact in, in education at the same time. One of the things that you all have mentioned had to do with the ethical and privacy um, that exists as well. And there are several concerns specifically with these two issues in, in education per se. So one of the things that I think is gonna continue evolution in just not only about the tool, but also it has to do on how we can ensure that student data is protected and used responsibly now that we are engaged into all this AI. Any, 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 any comments in, in regards to this? How do you think? What do you think uh, specifically uh, in regards to how we can ensure that student data is protected and used responsibly as privacy concerns around AI in education? So I would 
add, jump in and add a response to that. Mark's pointed this out before. You know, when we have talked to an innumerable faculty who are feeling threatened, understandably, by GPT-3 and, and chat GPT, and have looked at things like GPT-0 and other tools that promise to uh, give them the ability to detect whether or not a student has engaged in uh, GPT-3 or chat GPT. And those outside organizations do not have a contractual relationship with the university, our university. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, not only is it ethical in terms of a teaching and learning relationship to use outside parties that, that you don't have a relationship with or don't even really understand what they're going to do with your students' work, but then beyond that, if you were to determine that it was ethical to engage them, do you have a contractual relationship with them? And if your institution doesn't have a contractual relationship with them, they can do anything they want with the data that you're giving them, that your students have given to you as part of a teaching and learning process. So that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And so I often try to point that out to faculty. And when they have a chance to, usually when they have a chance to pause and to think about that, then they decline giving over their students' work to these third parties. And like, here. doesn't Google already have all of our stuff anyway? And students are writing all their stuff in Google anyway. So doesn't Google already have all of our intellectual property is something that I always think about. I mean, we've already given it all away. <laughs> I, I, I sympathize there. I think it's a great point. And here, here's my prop for today. Your students <laughs> have signed yeah. more contracts than we did at, at their age by far. Every single time they download an app. Have you read any of these contracts? Because we talk about with my students and they've never read any of these contracts. They've given away their data and everything else. Bob's point too about a lot of this just being scraped data that ignores any type of um, ethical use is very clear. And they're, they're sitting there with a smile. They say fair use. And they've given other examples of uh, this being done for technology too. Um, to me, from someone that looks at this from a contract's point of view, too, it's very clear that some of these lawsuits have pretty decent standing uh, to look at it. But when you sort of like go back out of that and start thinking about this globally, there's no way that lots of other countries are going to be um, looking at this in terms of any type of ethics. Uh, so when you think about the fact that we want to see some type of legislation for this in some way, shape, or form, I think we need some type of legislation, not just for text. I mean, my God, there are issues too of deep fakes, and now students can make deep fakes on their phones in class of other students, which is going to be a very big problem that I think is going to make students very much so aware beyond just text generators. Um, and that is going to be something we're going to have to talk about going forward, but until we get into sort of a global understanding of this where China, Russia, and other third-party actors agree to it, I don't think the United States is really going to try to um, zap that. Yeah, you know, thinking about it on, a, on an international scale, it also makes you think about, I mean, just to think about how we think about intellectual property and property in general, you know, I feel like Western ideas, this is almost getting to like a very deep level of like Western ideas and what we consider property and who decides what property is. Like, I think there's a bigger undergirding conversation here about individualism and collectivism and what is property that, I mean, I'm not like, that's when I need my like sociologists and like philosophers. Like I would love to see, like if we could redo this and like add extra guests and extra friends, like I would love to have like an intellectual property lawyer, a philosopher, like, you know, to, to, to talk to me about some of these issues because I want to know their perspective too. Um, because I, I think that so much of this is even just wrapped up in like what our very, very basic foundational societal views of property really are. Uh, and that also brings us uh, uh, to, to, you know, the opportunity um, to bring, you know, and the role that educators and researchers play in shaping the development of AI in education. 
So it, it's important to, to bring that into, into question and, and, and to bring that as well. Like, what is that role? How, how can definitely bring in different people together and, and, and definitely collaborating in order to, to have approaches that are effectively and can and get people trained as well so people don't feel uh, uh, basically lost in, in processes uh, as well. So, so, so I think it's a constant evolution, but definitely a collaboration between, between all the sectors specifically to address academia uh, and the academic issues as well that we are confronting uh, right now. So, so it's really interesting uh, this conversation, but how can we expand this conversation from our university walls. That's the thing, you know, because like it states most of the time in the university walls, you know, like all these wonderful conversations stay in there. How can we transfer that to the community? How can we transfer this conversation into the K-12 system? How can we transfer this into, into, in, into the, the business setting? You know, those are things that definitely come into mind and, in regards, and I think we have an ethical <laughs> responsibility of bringing all those things as well, not only leaving these conversations in our, um, I will say in our walls, uh, university walls, you know. I think real people like don't care. <laughs> like, not that they don't care, but like, I think I was having this conversation with my dad. He does HR and like, he's loving it. He is loving like the generation. They don't really care about intellectual property like I mean he is absolutely loving like he's like doing job descriptions writing new forms like for for him like he sees this as just a a wonderful world of productivity increasing um so like I feel like when we talk about taking it you know further outside like we just don't have the same concerns even <laughs> like because I feel like so much of what we do as academics is like very tied to intellectual property and like whose ideas these are, where did they come from? Who do I cite? But like, I don't feel like a lot of people really even care about that, like at a very basic level. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of examples of that too. Um, we saw one example, on, I think it was on TikTok or Twitter of a doctor using it to write patient appeals for and saving his time for insurance companies. And he's really excited because it's saving him time. But then people are noting in the comments is like, wait, these are creating fake references and you're sending this out as quickly as you can. You have no sort of understanding of what's going on with it. So we definitely need to talk about basic information literacy and AI literacy would go forward. But I agree, this is going to have a huge impact, especially on small businesses. You talk to people too that do their own books, that do their own marketing and everything else. This is now a one-stop shop for that um, if you have the actual know-how and knowledge to do so. And that is going to lead to a productivity revolution. But I also want to make sure that we're all clear on this too. Microsoft and Google are all now making these announcements about these wonder tools and paired with massive layoffs. So it's very clear that they're looking at this as a potential to say that this can help you with your different jobs in some way, shape, or form but you actually have to start using them or you might get laid off in some ways. I've got a cousin who's just trying to get into coding right now. And he talked to me the last day. He said, yeah, I don't know if I really want to do this anymore to learn both Python and Arbor. It's like, isn't that just going to be natural language right now? It's like, yeah, it might be. I mean, yeah, I think that's a really interesting conversation that I hope our advisory boards for our curriculum are you know different curricula engaging with as to what the jobs of the future are going to look like because I would hate for engineering and computing students who I study to go through all of the struggles and the challenges that they do to find themselves in five years not being employable because they haven't engaged with these tools in the ways that are now beneficial so I, I really hope that advisory boards and, and leaders of colleges are paying attention All right. Well, we're getting close to the the end uh, here as well. So, any last um, last comments that you would like to give to our our audience? I'm going to start with Robert. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity, and I would 
I'd just say it's also really helpful to know that we've got colleagues at different institutions that are wrestling with exactly the same issues. The things that we've talked about today, the issues I've heard discussed, uh, just really affirm to me that our we our values as teachers and instructors and researchers are you know similar and perhaps even maybe universal. So thanks for the opportunity, and I really appreciate to see what your insights are, and look forward to hearing from you in the future. I mean, I echo what has been said, and I I think that thinking about chat GPT and other tools for the future really just lies in what you're willing to do and what you're willing to engage with and how open to the future that you're willing to be just like any other technology. Mark? So I think, uh, thank you all for having us too, and I hope we can continue these conversations uh, as well. I do think what Bob said earlier, that this is going to change our definition of literacy, but I will say literacy is plural. Mm -hmm. And instead of thinking about policies, about things like this and types of um, you know university and academic in, uh, integrity, those all things matter a great deal. You're going to have to think about how you're going to train your faculty, how you're going to train yourself to keep up with this, to be able to um, basically understand what the world's going to look like six months from now, let alone six years from now. And that will be, um, I think, our, our biggest challenge yet. Well, we'll see where we go with all of this really interesting discussions. Uh, thank you for, for, for accepting the invitation. Thank you for saying yes. Uh, immediately, I am thankful that, that we were able to conduct this uh, second panel as well. And Let's see what, what it, the future holds as well. It's, it's really interesting as well. And you know, that goes. I wanna definitely uh, thank as well uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Linda Murphy for collaborating with me in organizing uh, these two uh, panel series. Uh, uh, has been amazing working with her and her group, including Ali Peterson and Teresa O'Dowd. Uh, thank you very much. Also thank you to Jess State uh, uh, for, for supporting this initiative and helping us out. So we'll see where we go from here. And thank you all for being with us. I will, I will uh, uh, request my guests to stay here just for a couple of minutes and we'll out. Thank you very much.